I'm Jen Valenga. This is the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. Stories of rewarding careers between starving artist and celebrity to give you the inspiration to ditch your backup plan. I was in casting college. I was learning how to be a casting director from the best in, on Broadway. Johnson Lift, Jeffrey Johnson, and Vinnie Lift. Tara Rubin was there, and she was really my mentor. I started doing a lot of television casting, which involved a lot of things that we, you don't do in theater, with like making the offers, negotiating contracts. Today's episode features Allison Frank. She's been a casting director for over 20 years, and she's worked in every medium. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, hi, fearless friends. Let's get right into it. Check out the show notes at ditchyourbackupplan.com. Here's my interview with my good friend, Allison Frank. Hi, Allison. Hi, Jen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from New York City, the Lower East Side. Allison and I, we probably met. Did we meet before we were in New York City? Okay, so what happened was I moved to New York in 1993 from Memphis, where I met your dear friend, Becca. And as I was leaving, she says, oh, I need your address again. And I give it to her. And I told her earlier that a blimp had fallen on my building. And she said, oh, Jen lives in in a building that the blimp fell on. And I went, there was only one building that the blimp fell on. On on um, 4th of July. Yeah. Yeah. And I, cause, cause it didn't happen when I was there, but my roommates were talking about it every, every five minutes. We discovered that you lived in my building. Yes. But we were in different sections of the building. So we didn't know, and we didn't know each other. We could have run into each other like six or seven times and had no idea. 53rd and 9th. Yeah. 53rd between 9th and 10th. We went to a lot of the same auditions together when we were both actors. Yes. And we would, we would plan it. We would go together. Yeah. Yeah, we would walk there. And, and you know, it's so funny. Back then, I thought that was such a long walk. Now I'm like laughing about how close it was. Those were some fun times, Allison. Those are really strange. It's so funny thinking back about it because, because as you know, like I, I run auditions for a living. But back then, I was going to them and I hated them. Yeah. I hated auditioning. So get into that a little bit. So how do you characterize your job? I'm a casting director, um, and I when people think the hear the word director and they hear the word casting, I think it confuses them. And I think the reason why the word, based on a couple of of many history history of casting directors, you know, it was an invented job. Or I mean, the job was always there, but different people could do casting before a casting director became a profession. And to this day, I still feel like casting is an invented job that no one we have no union. Like if you're doing a feature film, there's probably a budget for casting that casting has agreed upon. But and I do believe that there are casting directors who work in film and television. In fact, I know for a fact they're part of the Teamsters. So they do have insurance through the Teamsters. But if you're not working on feature films, you're not in a union. So Casting Society of America, of which you're a member, doesn't mean anything in terms of insurance or it's a club. Mm -hmm. And they have rules and they have you know, things that we should and shouldn't do. And the, the, one of the main things we work on is a lot of diversity casting caucuses. And, uh, you know, that's the most important thing we get right now from them. And there's some nice little perks. But overall, it's it's just like a place where we meet and discuss how we get paid and stuff like that. You know, what the current technology is for casting, because it changes every five minutes. Like the Zoom thing is still like, what is that? And I think equity is now working with, you know, Zooming and, you know, on-camera auditions or whatever you call this. I asked Elizabeth Nesselrode just a couple of episodes ago about auditioning. And I haven't done auditioning for decades, you know, not that way anyway. And she was still saying, oh, yeah, you know, when I would be the first non-equity person and I would start the sign up, I'm like, they still do a piece of paper out of your notebook and sign it up. And she's like, yep, it's all on the honor system. I'll, I'll tell you something. I tried to do a, a, a couple of casting directors. I spoke to them and I said, you know, at this point, why don't we sign up online? Sure. And I have you and I do use a thing. I spoke to different casting directors that were doing a lot of non-union tours. And I said, what do you do? And they said, we use this thing called Sign Up Genius. And there's other people who created their own. I think Michael Casera created his own. Sign Up Genius is for potluck moms. Yeah. It, and it And it worked. 
for smaller non-union kid things. I, I just wanted to make sure everyone was seen and we weren't forcing people to wake up at the crack of dawn, right? Mm -hmm. But when I did a really popular show in 2017, which was Legally Blonde, I used Sign Up Genius and I waited to tell them when the Sign Up Genius was going to go up. So, so people didn't miss it. What happened was, is I crashed the, I kind of crashed people's internet and it got filled up within two minutes. So we had to make a wait list. People who had signed up decided the day of that they were going to bail out. And there was a website called Audition Update and the kids would say that they gave up their slot and you could take it. That meant the waitlist people were bumped as well. So I, I freaked out. I was like, no more. So I stopped using Sign of Genius when that happened. And I changed it. And I said to, I said to them, I said, if they just signed up today, they're not on the sheet. Mm -hmm. Don't they, you can't honor it. But the fact that they didn't know that wasn't fair either. And then my assistants weren't cutting the people who were on the wait list. They were just letting people. I was like, no, 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 no. They go. Chaos. They go. And I was very, I was very mad. And I was like, forget it. I was like, forget it. We can't, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And other, otherwise, most shows, I could go back and use it because it didn't matter. Well, like when I'm ca casting for children, there aren't enough of them to take up a day like that. It's more like a show like Legally Blonde where it's all young people. Mm -hmm. It's all contemporary musical theater. It's a show everybody wants to be in. It's mostly females. It kind of is like the sweet spot for young non-union actresses to be like, gimme, gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. And so I would always have. So from that point on, whenever I did Legally Blonde, I did it an open call for real. Like you got to sign up like you, like we did in the old days. And then I would also do like by appointment. Mm -hmm. And the by appointments I treated like an open call, like a like a like an EPA. Yeah. 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 Define an EPA for me since you said that. Okay. Term. Equity principle auditions are uh, equity rules say that you get to audition for a Broadway show, a regional production, any equity theater production. They're required to have equity principle auditions before you see anybody who has been submitted through agencies. And those days are set aside a certain number. There are certain rules. Some days you have to have three days. Some you have to have two. Some you can have one, just depending on what equity has determined the rules would be based on the contract usually. So when I was at Paper Mill, I had to do... Paper Mill Playhouse in... Paper Mill Playhouse in, in, in Milburn, New Jersey. I worked there from 2000 to 2010. I think it was two or three. I think it was three days we would separate play EPAs. Mm -hmm. So that would be a separate EPA. And I think I could have a day for that. I know sometimes actors feel like EPAs are, because EPAs are required, they are, yeah. that you aren't really looking for anybody then. Is that true or not true? When I was at Paper Mill, I absolutely was looking for people. When I worked for Johnson Lift, I think we took it as an opportunity to meet new people. So I don't think that we would ever, okay, if you're doing your annual EPA for, at the time we were working on shows like Cats, Lame Miz, Phantom, when I worked at Johnson Lift, those were the shows we were doing. There were union tours of Broadway productions and Broadway shows. And we probably had per show, sometimes up to four productions. Two was normal. Like there might be two tours of Les Mis. Um, there were sometimes Canadian companies, which were cast out of Canada, but we sometimes would plop people in. Sometimes we did co-productions with Live End, again, Canadian company. Um, I remember there was a Joseph production we would sometimes cast parts on. But the, the main EPAs would always be for like Miss Saigon, Les Mis, Cats, Phantom. Those were the four big ones. Mm -hmm. And then we also did Victor Victoria when I was there. Big sideshow, Steel Pier. There were no tours of some of those shows. So you left Johnson Lift to go to Paper Mill, but you finished. No, up no, no. There's a big, huge bulk, bulk. There's two years in between. Oh, doing what? I decided I didn't want to act anymore in 1995. After two years of touring with Theater Works, I decided I didn't want to uh, be an actress ever again. No, I didn't want to tour ever again. And at the time, I'd always moved to New York City to either be a casting director or an agent or an actress. I was like, I'm going to do something. So when I got to New York City, I focused on the acting because it seemed like I hadn't. I, I seemed like I wanted to give it a little bit of a try, you yeah. know, before before I was like, screw it. 
And I went on tour for two years, got my equity card. I went back to New York after my second tour. I sent my resume out. I wrote a letter. I dropped it off. I hand, I walked around New York City with these letters. Hand delivering. I hand delivered my letter to, I had a list of addresses and I went to each casting office and I slid it under the door. Sometimes I knocked on the door. I don't even remember. I didn't mail anything. I walked around and did it. It wasn't because I was cheap. I just kind of wanted to know where everything was and maybe they'd see me and they'd be like, Oh, she looks cool. Let's hire her. And it was after I was acting. So I was collecting unemployment and I got an offer to be an intern at Johnson Love Casting in 95. And I also started interning for Lynn Kressel Casting at the same time. So I was interning two days a week at Johnson Lip and two, three days a week at Lynn Kressel Casting. And Lynn Kressel was casting. I mean, the main thing they cast is Law & Order. Suzanne Ryan was there. Um, but they were also doing like, I don't know, movies of the week. I loved both places. But Johnson Lip was constantly needing me to read for them. Mm-hmm. After that I was an actress, they'd just be like, oh, can you read? I'd be like, okay, with my script in hand. And I... I didn't, I don't even know if I was a good reader as a casting director, looking back on who good readers are. It sometimes has very little to do with, are you a good actor? It has to, are you a good read? It, it's a very different skill set. Once you do the scene like three or four times, you, you start to read well. <laughs> when you first, when you first do it, you're like, yeah, cause you're throwing the script. You know, you did, I didn't have time to prepare for this. I wasn't on the, I wasn't on the menu. <laughs> I had to leave because my unemployment ended. So I got a job at Reebok Sports Club, New York, my room. You know, it was so easy to get a a stupid job when I was young. I could get such great, great jobs. So I worked at Reebok Sports Club New York as a, I worked in the cafe as a cashier, but they paid me a lot of money and I didn't really do anything other than check people in. I was a terrible service industry person. (laughs) I was still interning at Johnson Lift because they wouldn't kind of let me leave and I kind of didn't want to leave. One of the assistants said she was going to leave. And I needed to stick around so I could get our job. So I hung on, I hung on. Mm-hmm. And then, and then by, I think it was February of 96, I, they started paying me money. Very little. I called it casting college. Cause it was basically like they paid me a stipend to work. And I lived in an apartment that was dirt cheap. It was on the Upper West Side. I had the maid's quarters, which was like. A closet. A mm-hmm. tiny room that I had a loft and I had a little tiny love seat and a TV and I could afford it. I could afford to work for very little money. My, my student loans were paid off as my father passed away and I got his money to pay off my student loans. So I didn't really have any debt yet. And I, um, I, was, I was in casting college. I was learning how to be a casting director from the best in, on Broadway. Johnson Lift, Jeffrey Johnson and Vinnie Lift, Vincent Lift. Uh, Tara Rubin was there and she was really my mentor and Andy Zerman and Ron LaRosa. There were five casting directors and Jamie Beth Margolis and I were assistants. And then she became an associate. We both became associates uh, after two or three years, but she started doing more like Les Mis casting. And I started doing a lot of television casting. I would say I was there over, over three years. I started doing a lot of television casting, which involved a lot of things that we, you don't do in theater with like making the offers, negotiating contracts, making the contracts, writing the deal memos, things I'd never done before, but I just learned because what else are you going to do? No one else is going to do it. You got to do it. So I remember one day, I think I got on the phone with the head of human resources at Disney because the show we worked on was through um, ABC Disney. And woman, I was on the phone for like nine hours or felt like nine hours, but I didn't even feel like it. I was just learning everything. And then by the time I got up, I knew how to do it. The computer wasn't really a thing yet. Yeah. You probably weren't a great typist either, huh? No, no. I learned how to type later, but yeah. So, so there was that. And then, you know, like you get a, you get a job like that when you're an actress, I was trained for nothing. Really. I was trained for nothing. I had no life skills. Life skill. I had no life skills. They gave me an opportunity based on my personality. In conservatory training, absolutely. You're trained for one thing, and that is to be an actress full time. And how, yeah. So like the fact that I had to do like work work. Well, the good news is, is that I was a nerd and I was a theater nerd. So I loved it. And they even said it to you. They were like, you had no skills. I was like, I know. But I figured it out. You're a hustler. And then you don't want to fail. 
you know, you just want to do everything right. So I started doing television and you learned on the job. Yeah. I learned on the, and that, that's why they, that's why they can get away with paying you so little. Cause like, you know, that you're useless. <laughs> I mean, you know, that you want to learn and that's your casting college. Yeah. Casting college. So then, you know, then I got out because I got a TV series as an assistant and it was great. And then I through that same casting director. Her name is Jill Greenberg. Sands and we did a TV show called Late Line, which was starred Al Franken, Robert Foxworth, Megan Price, Miguel Ferrer, Jose Ferrer's son, amazing actor. I left Johnson Lift as an assistant to be an assistant on this TV series that was canceled after 13. We didn't even finish. So I literally left my job (laughs) that was, you know, paying me pretty well by the time I left. And this job paid me better, but it ended. (laughs) I was waiting for the next job to start, which again was only like five weeks, six weeks working for DreamWorks, where we worked on um, pilots for DreamWorks, one of them being Freaks and Geeks. We did the New York casting. It was just in New York. I didn't have to go to LA. We talked to LA all the time. I I just, I didn't remember all the TV and film work, Allison, because I think of you so much connected to Paper Mill and is you just, you just know everything everyone you remember actors so well and I think that's a really important skill for a casting director I agree I think what's really hard now and this is just the reality is that that skill set as great as it is isn't as important now as having technical knowledge in film and Mm -hmm. television I would say in film and television like being able to film people being able to get those things uploaded knowing how to use the technology editing things knowing how to use new forum formats like I I gotta tell you like when I had to do a tv series figuring out who was talented and looking up who people were that was that's a piece of cake filming them uploading their videos and getting it in the in the randomly different like cast it's what most people use they were using a different one and and every cast it is a platform yeah Cast it's a platform. I've never technically ever used it, but it's very user friendly because I've I've taken workshops in it because I keep hoping one day I'll get to do a TV series or something. But like when I was working on this pilot, I only worked one week, but I still got paid for two weeks. And it was filming, filming, filming as many people as possible. But there was really only one girl they wanted and they hired her. So it was kind of like doing too much in order to satisfy the quota, which is a lot of what television is. You want to make sure you're just seeing everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you, you can be picky because there's so many people who want to do it, but it's all it's it's not just a numbers game. It's knowing that you're seeing the right people. So go back to what you were saying about technology, because I've been this year in 2021, I've been trying to do more interviews on the digital space. And you're a yeah. good person to ask because you started in the early days when, you know, things were not automated. But but the thing is, for, for theater, we like the hard copy. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. because when we're done casting especially when you're casting like a musical with a lot of people we like to throw the pictures on the floor and turn them around and read our notes whatever it is we've done to the pictures in order to say what part they are or the post-its there's a lot of post-its involved that move um but like the directors i work with still live in that world a lot of it's not even that they're old like some of the directors are younger than me but that's um, the system that exists and it's still maintain is maintained. Yeah. In my in my perspective, yes. Um, a lot of people have tried to move things digitally. I remember somebody created this amazing casting, like all online. And it was really app an or applicate yeah, application yeah, software. An app, but it 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 only worked if everybody in the room had it and agreed sure. to it and was willing to learn it. And that in itself is its own challenge because nobody likes to change, you know? I mean, some people would want to change. You just got to be like baby steps, right? Mm -hmm. Now though, what I do do now is I remember I like to put people's, I mean, I noticed other people were doing it too. And I was like, oh, I want to do that too, which is you put your, their picture under their name. It costs a lot of ink, but these were things like I was doing on my own. And then mm-hmm. I stopped doing because other people I was working with were like, you don't have to do that. I was like, okay, if you, like, you want to, whoever's in charge of the project, like I worked for other people more or less since, you know, I worked for paper mill and I was doing my own thing for them. I didn't add the picture. I think I tried to add the pictures once, but it was just like back then the technology wasn't ready for that. Mm-hmm. And then I started, then I saw like 
oh, that casting director has pictures on there. And you can do that through breakdown services. They haven't, if you just want to use their app, but I like to create my own. So there's enough room to write. I don't like to necessarily, what I learned from Johnson Lip is have the contact information for the actors on the page that you give out to other people, because you don't want to give away your, your, the thing you worked so hard for was those connections and that information. If they need to cast something again, if they have all that information, why would they call you? Right. Good point. They they take pictures anyway, and they have people's contact information anyway. So it's, it's kind of like a bogus thing anymore, but to me anymore. Right. But I, I still think these not people are not that crafty. Like you have to give them the information for, in order for them to have it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to know to search the way I will. Mm-hmm. You know, like if somebody says a name of an actor, I don't go, what's their contact information? I just search it. Sure. Yeah. So, and it's expected. It's expected that I know how to do that. It's sure. Because expe- we have our own like breakdown services. I also use like Facebook and Instagram to find people all the time. Yeah. And, and backstage. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about breakdown services? Breakdown services is like the monopoly on it's the app used to be another thing, but it's now it's a, it's an, it's an online app. I I don't even know if they have an actual app on the phone, but it's the, the, what's the word platform. It's the platform that is most used for, for putting out breakdowns and sending them off to agents and actors. So breakdown services also has a little spinoff. That's actually part of it all called actors access. So people can do self submissions on any breakdown that we allow on actors access because I cast a lot of non-union projects. I always put things on Actors Access, but I don't know if like a feature film would be on Actors Access. I don't, it's really for casting directors. Beginning non-union actors often use Actors Access. Right, right. It's, and it's similar, and it's similar to backstage now in the same way, but, but breakdown services, it, it initially they used to uh, drop off the breakdowns to agents. And the casting directors would send them to, you know, it was all by messenger. And I think it started in Los Angeles. I remember hearing the whole story going, oh my God, it was like a mom and pop shop. (laughs) They created their own industry. And then what ended up happening is, uh, you know, it changed to more online, you know, over the years. But when I started casting, it was all through fax. We would fax the breakdown and then the (laughs) breakdowns would be faxed. And then the next morning you would get all that. You might get some faxes with just the names of the actors they want to submit, but you usually got an, the delivery or the messenger services in New York would come and you would get piles and piles and piles of headshots and resumes and a, and a cover letter saying who was submitted for what. Now it's all online. Um, Isn't Gen X just the receptacle of the transition? Oh yeah. Oh, totally. Like it was so funny because like one of the questions you had was, where did you grow up? How is your growing up different than your life, lifestyle now? My growing up differently was is that I was, I grew up in, in the suburbs of Boston, uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, totally latchkey kid. My mom worked until about, you know, three or four in the afternoon. So we would come home a little bit before and let ourselves in and we watch TV. You have a twin brother. I have a twin brother. There was a lot of riding bikes. There was a lot of hide and seek. There was a lot of in the snowstorms, fort building. There was a lot of come home for dinner when the street lights come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, my parents had a whistle they blew. <laughs> that was how we knew it was time. And if we were out of distance to hear the whistle, and we, we got home. We didn't come when we were whistled out. We were in big trouble. But by the time I was in high school, I was a real like nerd. And I was like really into theater, really. And so after school, I was always doing a rehearsal or choir practice, madrigal, we called it. My father would drive me to school, me and my brother to school every day. Most of the times we were late because somebody overslept. We would get there, you know, and then when it was time to go home, they would always pick us up after rehearsal or whatever. But if it was earlier, like two o'clock when you normally got out of school, if you didn't do any after school activities, I would walk home. But I always made a detour to the library, always. And I lived in the theater section. They didn't have tapes then, or they had some, but mostly it was cast albums. Or I would take out library books, um, play scripts, or my favorite was a best of theater. It had the, the, the Hirschfeld drawings in there and it would say who won what awards and what plays were up for what awards. And I would just read about every show I could and what, like if I was doing a show, I was, let's say I was doing a play in school, which I always was, 
I would go to the library to see who played my part. Hmm. Now I could just go to IMBD or IBDB or IMDB to see, you know, like to see what actors up to like the, the tools that I have now, which I love, I'm obsessed with them. But the work I had to go through to get that information when I was younger was, it was quite, a, it was a lot. Yeah. Would, the journey. I would, take out, I would take out all of these books and my parents had to pick, I would call my mother and pay phone mom. I'm still at the library. I can't walk home. I have too many books. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was so close. It was all really, it was all. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I think it is important to to stay on top of all those digital tools. But it to me, it feels like in the last, well, definitely with COVID, but the last couple of years, right. it just is just so f- incredibly fast the way things are changing. I know. And it breaks. It, what's funny is I always say to I, whenever I teach kids, I'm like, remember, do you know, kids know what a library is? Like, they know. <laughs> yes, so of course. It was, something, it was something about the library that felt like you were you took the time. And you, I wasn't doing it for a class most of the time. I was just doing it for my own. I loved it. Well, then you stumble upon, I guess, I guess you, well, it's so clickbaity and so curated for you anymore online. You're, you're being targeted based on the things that you click on. But in the library, you go and you pull out a book and I, I guess in a way it's sort of curated for you because you're in the section of whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I think it was like a performing arts section and I mm-hmm. knew where, the, I mean, I memorized where all the books were. They sometimes would move them. It would upset me terribly. Is how you're living your life now in the middle of New York City, the Lower East Side of New York City, is it different than your daily life when you were young? Absolutely. Well, right now because of coronavirus. But before that, yeah. I mean, it's very different. Living in the city is just a different world than living in the suburbs. First of all, you really can't have a car. Not that I do, but not that I ever did. But like, you're not a slave to that. You're so, um, it's up to you to know how long it takes the subway to get you somewhere or, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing that you have to call a car because the subway is unpredictable or knowing that you have to walk a certain amount of time and how long it takes to get there. There's, I have no kids or anything. So like, I don't have to take care of anyone other than myself. So, I mean, I have a boyfriend, but you know, we take care of each other in a very sort of cohabitive way. And your parents were artists. Um, my mother was a librarian uh, a children's literature, like a, a elementary library. And she ran. So you come by the library, honestly. Yeah, I do. Um, but she was more into stories. Like she's a storyteller and she's a, a children's literature expert. And she ran the elementary library library in Natick, Massachusetts, which is right next door to Framingham. Uh, that's where William Finn is from, if any theater geeks out there. And he wrote a song called Something, something, Natick, Massachusetts. The, don't listen to the song. It's very sad. It's a beautiful song. But it's very sad. Betty Buckley sang. It's so gorgeous. Um, but <laughs> uh, that's a very, but William Finn's a very specific Natick, Massachusetts writer, but he also has a, a different perspective than like I would say my life was like. So that my mom worked in the, in the Natick elementary school system and she had her own like cable access show. So she was like a story. T- she was an actress too. She did a lot of like community theater um, and college. That's when my parents met in college theater. My father wanted to be an actor for a minute. He really wanted to make movies. So he was a photographer and a filmmaker. Um, but he also could sew. He was a pattern maker and hold on a carpenter. Hmm. So he builds, he could build things really well. He bought the house we live in. We lived in growing up, um, to remodel it. So it's like a, it's like a Victorian and it was, it was a beautiful house, but it was a mess. So we were always, he was always like fixing up a room taking it down, remodeling it, you know? So it was always like, it was a little crazy. It was a little, it was a little, um, you can't take it with you. Mm -hmm. When you say you come from this kind of eccentric family, how did they feel about you going into theater, going to school for theater, wanting that to be a career? They they wanted it. Yeah. Did you have a backup plan? Nope. No No, backup plan. No backup plan. Not even a clue what I was going to do. I never even thought I would want one. Mm-hmm. Never even thought I needed one. Do even you need I one? In a casting? No. No. Okay. No. No. Even when I thought I got into casting, I don't think casting was my backup plan as much as I fell into it. I think the reason I chose to leave performing was that I was, I, I felt, and, and, uh, and you'll understand this, I wanted to do something different. I gave the best audition of my life, probably the last audition of my life right? Because I don't think I've auditioned for anything since. I didn't get it. They wanted me to go back to do The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
because I was the only one being replaced. They, it was the only track that they were replacing. And they first had asked me to do that. And I said, can I audition for other things? I said, sure. I went to a show that they did. And the director was the same director of the show. And he goes, oh, I know who you are. I said, yeah. He goes, you were the girl we wanted to cast. And I was like, it's not up to me, is it? It's not up to me. I can't choose what I want to do. I just, it really was frustrating for me. And I, I remember going, I don't want to do this. If it's going to be that hard, if you do the best audition of your life and you know, those people want you and they have the ability to move you to another area because it's more financially good for them, you know, so they only have to rehearse you for a week because you did the show before. That's what it was. Yeah. I mean, it's a business and I can, I mean, I just remember being on a, on tour for third month, fourth month, which is really not very long when you think about it. No. I spaced out and I was still singing away, but I'm not really in the moment. And that's not good. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm too trained to know that this is not good for me to be not focused. And I, I mean, now that I've had a lifetime of many, many things, including, you know, mostly education and creating lots of things as a director with playwrights and taking things different places and being someone who's instrumental in making that all happen, that just wasn't going to be for me. Right. I still love to act. I love to be asked to act. And I I respect the work too much to yeah. allow me to be the person that's going to space out on stage. Right. I should I should honor it more than that, which is maybe a little idealistic. I also think you should have cut yourself some slack. Everybody has off days. Oh. Of course. I mean, I know that now, but at 20 something, it was like, oh, I'm not good enough for this. Like you're so hard on yourself. Actors are so hard on themselves. Like if you go back into a time machine and remember when you were auditioning and remember the bad auditions, you know, because I can remember the good ones, but the bad ones, I remember more. And as a casting director, I see people audition badly all the time and I forget. And you can see through it. You know when it's a bad audition. Unless it's mean spirited and lazy like they didn't do the work like they weren't prepared like they don't want to be there unless it's like a mean spirited person or a, a mean spirited moment because people can be a perfectly good person and have a mean day you know mm -hmm. i just think we don't hold on to it the way people think we do and some people do i mean i know that there's i know that there's people who have audition actors over and over and over, you know, maybe two or three times and like three strikes you're out. I know that there's casting directors out there who feel that way. I don't, I just don't because I know not everybody's cut out for, for every audition that they're, they receive, you know, not everybody's going to nail it. Mm -hmm. no, and, and that same person who doesn't nail today, could go in for another job tomorrow and book it. Yeah, that's that's good for you to stay open like that, especially when you're talking about non-union and working with the young actors who haven't quite figured out the audition grind yet. Right. Or the people who like I always feel a lot of times when I see the same people over and over and over again, and I liked them, but I put them through their paces before and I know what happens in the final callbacks. I have to hesitate because I cast the Grinch. I've been casting the Grinch for 10 years, mm -hmm. 11 years, actually. It would, it, will, it would have been 11. It, it's 10 still. It's still, it's still standing at 10 because coronavirus like kicked it out this year. But like I, 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 the director is the same director and he remembers people. So I have to sometimes like say, I'm not bringing you back this year because I know he doesn't respond to what you do or I'll work with them. Or, you know, it just depends on like the process changes for me all the time. Casting is, is, is not a cut and dry. Like there's no, there's rules. There's definitely rules. Like there's certain things that are really important to stick to as a casting director, but there's also things that change. And how we do this changes and how we treat people changes. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean how you treat people? I think that there was permission given to tell like uh, uh, recently an actor just posted on social media that a, a director spotted him in the hallway after he didn't book a show. And he took him aside and said, you're really talented, but you're in between weights. You're too heavy to be the leading man but you're too skinny to be the character man. You've got to choose one. I think you should gain weight and be a character man. You can't say that to people anymore. A, it's mean, it's unhealthy, it's mean, and it's not true. 
it's just not true. But there was an old school feeling that, that there was a certain look for a certain time, like all the time. And and at the time I was maybe in my early casting years, maybe when I worked for paper mill, I believed some of those things. And I may have, you know, not told people to lose weight, but like, you know, I think, I think that you're, you need to really gear yourself towards this type of character or this type of character. You're in between. You're not really, I'm not really, and now I don't feel that way. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think that it's that simple. It's funny you say that because I do, I've always done some speech coaching. Yeah voice and speech work. And and certainly when I was in Miami, I got a lot of clients who were English as a second language, and it was all about, quote, unquote, accent reduction and or accent elimination. And I just don't believe in it anymore. I won't even do it. I won't do it. I'll say we can work on clarity. We can work on pronunciation. But there's we're not doing accent elimination because that's what makes you who you are. Right. That's you. What has been your biggest risk in your career? I would say anytime I changed gears. So I would say when I decided I wanted, well, even like taking a job to go on tour the first time, that's a risk because you have a lot of things you have to give up, like your apartment. I had to give away my cat. I had to bring my cat to my mother's house when I, you know, a lot of things happen and change when you decide to go on tour. And then when I decided I didn't want to be an actress and I decided I wanted to intern as a casting person. And then when I started getting the ball rolling with casting, leaving Johnson Lyft to go work on a television series was a gamble. And it wasn't necessarily the smartest decision I made, but I did it. You know, I think anytime you choose to do something that isn't comfortable, it's a risk, Mm -hmm. right? You know, when I chose to take paper mill, it was a big risk. I was working for a television show. I mean, I was no, I was working for Nickelodeon. I got a job, a permanent position at Nickelodeon to do promos. I was super excited. And then there was no work. And in and I first got hired, I first got hired in the beginning of that month, I think it was like May of 2000. And I also was doing my I was doing some side some side, side casting as well that I could do outside. And they, there was no work. And a month into it, well, the beginning of that, the paper mill, had, my friend who was working at paper mill told me that the, her position was opening because she was leaving. Do you want it? Basically, you can have the job if you want it. Like I've already told them about mm-hmm. you. And I was like, no, I just started this job at, at Nickelodeon. And then the end of the month, they said, we're going to have to lay you off for three months because we don't have any promo work. And I called my friend at paper mill and I said, um, remember I might want, I went to paper mill on Friday and I got the job. I was in the middle of an audition for another project I was working on. I used to work on the donkey show with Diane Paulus. I had to tell them too. I I have to go to paper mill and it's exclusive. At the time it was exclusive. I couldn't do anything outside of it. Mm -hmm. And I took it. And it was like literally a change. I was working in New Jersey. I had to commute from the upper West side to New Jersey and it was a huge change, but it, it changed my life working there. Mm-hmm. It made me like an independent casting director on my own. And I had never, nobody like, I hadn't done it like that. So have you made it, Allison? How, do you think you've made it? And you know, it's funny. I, I don't think I've made it in the sense that like I'm famous or anything, but I feel like, wh- how do I put this? When I was at Paper Mill, I felt like I was... A, I was one version of myself and I think I did the best version of myself as I could when I was there. And then now that I'm working in the capacity that I'm working now, which is teaching a lot, dealing with this coronavirus, I feel like I have made it through like this, this coaching. I feel like I've really embraced coronavirus, like quarantine, staying at home, how do you make it work? You've been doing a lot of training young kids and coaching. Yeah. And so so what happened was is in, in the beginning of this whole thing, which was in March, you know, like I want to say March 13th, we were told to stay home. I was going out and teaching that whole week before. And um, I had been casting a lot. Like I was busier than ever. And I had a million things on my plate. I was going to teach here. I was going to teach here. I was going to make, I was doing better than I ever had. I had more jobs lined up. More things were going to happen. And then everything shut down. My friend Rance, who I've known for years, he's a uh, vocal coach, acting coach, 
he he said, let's start doing a Zoom. He, he said, we're just going to start doing a Zoom. I guess Zoom was sort of kind of hovering. And I said, okay. And I set up my, I, gave, I came up with a setup in my apartment. I cleaned, I rearranged my whole apartment to make it work. I got a stand for my computer and I got a ring light and I got, well, at the time my computer wasn't doing Zoom. It had no sound. So I was using my iPhone for like the first two months I was using my iPhone, which was actually works great. Um, but the computer's better for like, or like running the classes. So I ended up doing a class with like two students. And then we went to like two to like four students. And then by the summer, we had like a group of like 25 kids taking our summer conservatory. And it was the same kids just kept coming back and coming back. And I think, and I explain this, I think one of the reasons that I get so many kids involved with me and why I've been teaching kids so much is that I cast so many kids. So my annual Grinch, I cast four little girls. And then I do an annual Christmas story. I cast eight little kids, mostly boys. Like I think it's uh, no, it's 12, it's 12 kids. So I, I cast up to six, anywhere from 16 to sometimes 20 kids. Cause sometimes I do two productions of Grinch a year. And I've been doing it for eight and it was 2004. So it's like seven and 10 years. So like, I have like all these kids that I've met and, and they, they know of me. And I bring every kid in like, like, so if a kid submits, I see them. So they know who I am. That's so good, Allison. But I think one of the things you have to remember is when you're teaching classes online, you know, as you know, adults can take these classes too, but we're always going to get more kids because their parents can afford it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ones who take our classes, their parents can afford it. Right. I do do some free, I do do some free workshops though, for sure. Yeah. We'll have to link to those so that any, if anyone's interested or has kids interested, they can. Yeah. Find you. Um, yeah, I, I guess I've made it. I feel like that makes me feel like I've made it. The fact that I can take my name, put it out there and people will sign up to take my classes. Now, granted, if you're offering people an acting job, they're more likely to think that you're like, oh, someone I can talk to about theater or I don't think I have to work that hard. I mean, I could work harder at it, but I don't think it would change the people who are interested. Mm-hmm. I'm also casting this movie called Teenage Musical um, that sounds, it's really exciting um, and they really want to hire real teenagers and it's going to be filming in Florida and it's a great dark script. Do you need any actors to submit? Um, well, we have sort of on hold right now. We're putting it on hold right now, but um, I would say just keep checking my website or keep checking my Frank casting um Instagram. Well, actually, the Instagram is Allison R. Frank. It's one L and Allison R, and then it's F R A N C K. Allison is A L I S O N. One L. Frank. F R A N C K. So she has an easy name, Allison Frank, spelled different for both, differently for both names. Am I right? Yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, I have to spell my name for everybody. What happens to you when you get something from an actor who spells your name wrong? Well, if they try to email me with the wrong name, I won't get it. Right. There's that. There's that. But someone else will. There's another girl with my name who sometimes forwards them, but not usually. Um, when I would get a letter, I usually, I'm more forgiving of my first name than my last name because Frank with a CK is so specific, but the two L's and Allison, it's easy to visually not see that there's only one because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the I and the L kind of blend together. But it's really funny when they have my email right, but they write, Dear Allison with two L's. I'm like, oh, it's just it's just who they are. You know, like some people just don't have the attention to detail. And you don't, that doesn't really make you too mad. It, it no, no. I mean. Get it right, but it's think, not going to, you're not going to not cast them because of that. No, God, no, <laughs> God, no, 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 no. If you're, I'm not going to cast somebody if they're a jerk, but not if they don't know how to spell my name. No, I get more frustrated about misspellings of other people I know or characters or plays or theaters or, you know, yeah. if it's me, I'm like, I, cause I've seen my name spelled wrong. So yeah. Many times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you have to see it to be it. Who did you have to see in order to know that you could have the career you have now? Oh, that's such a great question. I guess, you know, when I was, this is a weird answer, but when I was working at Lynn Kressel, which was my very first internship, I didn't stay there to keep working there. And it wasn't that I didn't love them or I didn't love television. I just knew that I had, I was better suited for Johnson Lift, which cast musicals. 
but I was the TV girl at Johnson Left because I was I knew more about television than the other you know the other people who worked there because I was a big TV geek as well. But when I worked at Lynn Kressel's office, there was a casting associate there who was also an actress, and she did both. And her name is Marcia DeBonis. You've probably seen her. She's a character actress in a million movies. And she's also a great casting director. And there was just something about her. And this is, again, before we had the internet ruling our lives. This was in 1995. I just remember not only how hard she worked, but how generous she was to everybody. I didn't understand it at the time why I loved her so much, but now I understand it. Yeah. She was delightfully herself. I mean, I could say how I love Tara Rubin and what an amazing mentor she was. She knows I feel that way, but like there was something about Marsha DeBonis that was so refreshingly messy Mm -hmm. and wonderful. She wasn't messy. She wasn't messy at all. She did everything, but she wanted to do everything and more. Like she wanted to dot her eyes, cross her T's and jump up. Like she, she wanted to make sure everybody was seen, everybody was prepared and, and she didn't miss anything. And so she, she, she lived it. She lived casting like no one I've ever seen. Cool. We'll have to tag her in the episode. And she'll have no idea. She'll won't even remember. She'll be like, who? Yeah. No, but I just, she was so delightfully herself and she was such a generous person. That's so important in our business. Yeah. Do you have recommendations of things that people, you think people should see, listen to, read, anything you're watching right now? I would say if you haven't seen The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, watch it. It's amazing. Amazing. But I just watched, I just binged like crazy episodes. I haven't seen episodes. Okay. It stars these two British actors who come to the United States to write, to take their British pilot like The Office and turn it into the American version. And they get stuck with Matt LeBlanc. Yeah. Did you watch Bridgerton? Oh, of course. I ate I, twice. <laughs> twice. If someone listening wants to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? My email is allison.frank at gmail.com. And that is the best way to get in touch with me. I know my website says allison at frankcasting.com. You can do that too. It all goes to the same place. I like to give out the Gmail because if my website goes down and sometimes it does, I might lose an email. So I'd rather just tell you it's Allison, one L and Allison, F-R-N-C-K. There's a dot in between at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you. Allison, it's been so good to talk to you. Where have you been all my life? I miss you. I miss you too. You're going to move back to New York? Um, Maybe. My son has to get to college first, you know? Yeah. Allison, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've been dying to have you on. I know that what you've said is going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Love you. Love you too. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I love you. (laughs) You've been listening to the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. I'm Jen Valenga. Next week features Logan Rose Nelms. She's an actor and she's an ambassador for Noonday Collection. It's going to be a great interview for International Women's Day, which is Monday, March 8th. Listen for her interview on Tuesday. Thanks for listening.